I'm going to tell you a story that has a horrible start and uh, hopefully a good ending with a big question mark that is still unsolved, okay? It all starts when I was uh, still young, back in uh, 1993. I was 26 years old. Uh, I was a student, I had uh, two startups, you know, lived an uh, intensive life, um, undergrad and graduate together and I had the Midas touch. I extremely succeeded in everything. Um, I did not spend time sleeping. I slept on average maybe two or three hours a night, and it was fine. I was, I was high on life. Uh, everything was great. Um, one day, riding my motorcycle from the university to my startup, uh, I had an accident, was rushed to the hospital, and uh, a uh, head CT that was done discovered a brain tumor. <laughs> brain tumor? Me? <laughs> the neurosurgeon told me that uh, I must be operated as soon as possible. It may be cancerous and I just can't wait. Um, I was obviously completely shocked but still try to uh, question and understand, I mean, what are my odds? Um, what's going to happen? You know, it's like a bomb falling on you. Um, and I understood it's uh, located in a nasty location and I will probably survive the, the surgery, but I will have some, most probably some cognitive dysfunction. I will have epilepsy and I will become hemiparetic, meaning Half of my body will be crippleized. Um, you know, this was more than overwhelming. You come just because of an accident and you learn that your life is over. Um, I didn't fully understand what he said. I was definitely in a state of shock, but I looked him in his eyes and for some reason, I was not sure that he was completely honest and open with me, and um, crazily enough, I decided not to go for surgery. I followed my instincts and uh, met two additional neurosurgeons, and to my surprise, one told me, I'm not sure, go and do an MRI in three months and let's see what's there inside, and the second recommended to have a biopsy. And the, at this point, what do you do? Go to a fourth surgeon? What do you do? Um, I, I felt my life is over. I understood that I'm going to die. And I, I, I was so sorry for myself because I had such an amazing plan for myself. And there it is, this tumor is going to kill me. Um, but eventually, I decided to fight for my life. And there was no reason to, to see another neurosurgeon, right? So I just started, went to the medical library. Again, this is 93, no internet. Uh, and started uh, learning anatomy, biology, all this medical and neurosurgical jargon that obviously I knew nothing about. And every time I felt I already understood and I took one step forward, <laughs> I was slapped and took two steps backwards. I mean, it was, it, it, it was tough, like to have a crash course in, in, in medicine and, and uh, in uh, neurosurgery. Um, the worst part was that everyone around me thought I was insane, I was crazy, okay? My parents, my friends, everyone thought I was just irresponsible and uh, I had no one to support me. I, I was all alone in this fight. Now, I, I was so desperate that uh, although I was always very skeptical about alter alternative medicines, I just tried everything, okay? So Chinese medicine, both acupuncture and herbs and bioergonomy and macrobiotics and biofeedback and and AET, and hypnosis, and megadose vitamins, and the worst, 
eating lots of garlic. And, and trust me, you wouldn't want to not only kiss me, you wouldn't even want to get close to me those days, okay? In the process of learning all these alternative medicines, I realized how much I disregarded my body, okay? I, I behaved like a ruthless boss, okay? I also understood that was a, I was addicted to stress, I was addicted to not sleeping, okay? Um, and although I loved it and I, I managed very well under stress, I understood that my body disagreed with me, okay? Um, I also estimated, I mean, why would a guy at the age of 26 develop a brain tumor? And I estimated that with all the respect to my, to my genes, that my crazy lifestyle had some factor. Uh, we all know that the immune system is suppressed when you're stressed or angry or etc. And I decided to try and uh, revise my life. Uh, obviously, I couldn't prove, and no one, I, it's not that I guess that if I will eliminate the stress of my life, the tumor would disappear, but, you know, you're going to die, you hope, right? Um, and I did know that when I had too many sleepless nights, or when I were, whenever I was, like, extremely angry or extremely disappointed, I would typically cap catch a cold, and that's, again, because the immune system is suppressed. Uh, so the immune system was not immune to such behaviors or, or thoughts. And uh, mindful of this knowledge, I decided to give my body some respect. Okay, it was not easy for a robot to admit that, but I basically forced myself to sleep at least four hours a day, a night. It, it, it was crazy, and I, I actually thought it's a complete waste of my time. Okay, I identified over the following years the stressing factors, and I either eliminated them or learned how to, to deal with them. And of course, I improved my nutrition. Uh, I even reduced my, my beloved 10 cups of coffee to two. That was painful. Now, every three months, I had a follow-up MRI, and I was certain that the tumor would shrink. And you can guess what happened, right? Every time it would ha ha ha, laugh at me, and continue growing. Um, it, it, it was a crash, okay? Every time I would have to pick up the pieces from the, the, the floor, and uh, for some reason I had some internal belief that eventually I, I will win, okay? And after 18 months of repetitive MRIs and MRIs and MRIs. And of course, all this time I had a headache. And the radiologist basically shouted at me that I have like significant hydrocephalus and I'm just going to die if I'll not be operated on. And uh, I had no choice but to surrender and listen. I chose a relatively innovative procedure uh, that was developed by Dr. Patrick Kelly in NYU. Um, and uh, I was among the first people that were operated that way. It was shown on the CNN, and this was the, whatever you saw in the beginning of my talk. Uh, it was pretty complicated, and I suffered like for six months of complications in and out from the hospital, but eventually I, I felt better, flew back to Israel, and uh, took the time to recuperate and, and, and gradually get back to normal life. Um, I felt an amazing victory. I had no symptoms, and all this crazy story was behind me. It was, uh, I even celebrated the day of my surgery as my second birthday. I, I felt I, I, I was reborn, okay? I mean, against all odds. Um, shockingly, after 18 months, you know, every three or six months I did an MRI, um, I discovered that the tumor is still there. I still had a residual tumor. Uh, I felt such a defeat, you know, all this amazing win is, was all temporary. Of course, I flew back to Dr. Kelly in New York, and I was certain that he would just reoperate on me. I already had a highway all the way till the middle of the brain. It should have been an easy procedure. 
And astonishingly, astonishingly uh, he said, and, and it, it still shouts in my ears today, I don't have the technology to fully resect such a deep-seated tumor. You're lucky that you have a benign tumor. You can wait five years. And if you're lucky, someone will invent it, OK? <laughs> Great. Now, he thought it was probably kind to me, you know, that I still have a few years to live. But I understood I'm doomed. I'm going to be a zipper head. And every five years, they're going to open, close. I'm going to suffer six more months. <sighs> How could you live your life like that? Was, um, what happens if no one invents this stupid camera? I, I felt so helpless, you know? And even much worse than the first time when I was diagnosed, now I knew how difficult it was. And even the best surgeon in the world could, couldn't save me. W what do I do? I had no hope. And trust me, it's not fun to live that way. Um, the frustration that a small, stupid tumor is going to kill me and no one can help me? It, it was just unacceptable. And, and with all due respect to the first diagnosis, this was my real wake-up call. And uh, being endlessly curious, I had to understand why great companies like Olympus or Zeiss didn't develop this solution. I mean, how come? I, I, I needed it to live. And, uh, I started learning, you know, visual perception and the way that the brain is built, and more of uh, camera technologies and stereoscopic vision. Obviously, I was ignorant in all these fields. And uh, after two years, I thought, I guessed what was the issue. You can't really know. And I invented a solution. It was a single miniature silicon chip that multiplex the environment and could provide with a proper image processing algorithms a stereoscopic image. And this is what my surgeon, in, surgeon need. It basically, it was, I did not invent it. It was mimicking the insect eye, OK? I left my job, <laughs> founded VisionSense, filed patents, and tried to raise funding. And I was already a successful entrepreneur. I was sure that you know, they would pour money all over me. And to my surprise, all of them said, you're crazy. You have a ticking bomb in your head. Even the best surgeon can't operate on you. And you want us to invest? Hello? Even worse, the typical surgeon said he doesn't need it. And physics professors that I consulted with said it's, it's never going to work. So knowing that I heard so many no's, I knew I was on the right path, OK? <laughs> I knew they were wrong. I managed to somehow scrape $100,000 moved to a garage, hired a physics PhD, because I, I really had no understanding in these. And, and it took us probably a year to develop like a huge feasibility prototype to show that this thing actually can work. Um, I decided to go to, an, an, to another surgery um, because, because I needed to raise money. And obviously, a surgery that was supposed to be simple, complicated, two, three procedure, and more months, and more recuperation. But eventually, I was fine. And I fought and dedicated the next nine years um, to making this thing happen, uh, going through lots of technological hurdles and barriers, and obviously financial, and grew lots of help gray hair in the process. But eventually, we succeeded. We made it. Um, I would like to show you a few slides. So th this was my inspiration, you know, the, the insect. Nothing is smarter than biology, right? And this is the sensor. I mean, I brought it with me, but it's, it's, it's too tiny to show. Um, it could be packed either in a rigid or, or malleable scope. And, and these are inserted into the, into the brain. And the whole point is that these allow a significantly, here, this is the malleable guy uh, with a distal 3D camera. And the whole point is, this is brain surgery. You could see the nose. You could see the camera inserted through the nose. So 
approaches like transnasal or key eyebrow or behind the ear or posterior fossa. So really, really tiny entrances to deep-seated lesions were enabled by this invention. And uh, I mean, it, 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 was, it was really great. Um, by the way, I, I have the, if you'd like to see, touch, feel more, I'm more than happy if anyone wants a demo. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm fine with it. Um, move on. So you understand, this is the patient basically, and you could only see the nose, all the rest is draped. So um, This was 2008, okay? And at the time, the market was not ready for 3D. Um, you need luck to succeed. Um, the real breaking point was the movie Avatar, and that made 3D popular, and it made uh, 3D screens uh, available, etc. And in retrospect, I understand that I invented vision sense too early, and the timing is everything in life, okay? Or you needn't be smart if you're lucky. In any case, I mean, it's a good ending, and I'm recuperated, and the technology works and saves thousands of lives, globally now, um, but I must admit that I still couldn't stop questioning myself. W why did I need a ticking bomb to wake up, okay? And what would have happened if doctors could have analyzed my stress, would have warned me that I need to sleep? Just like we go now and they, they would warn us if we have high sugar level that we can be diabetic or we have high blood pressure that we can, God forbid, they have some cardiac diseases. And even more during all these years, and it's 20 years, um, I supported hundreds of patients with various tumors and I realized how significant was their emotional state on the recuperation, survivability, and long-term results, okay? with exactly the same techno surgical technology. Many of them were stressing themselves out. Others regularly consumed antidepressants, forgot what, what happiness was. And frustrating, most frustrating, many of them redeveloped their tumors. And again and again and again, I saw that the, the people that revised their life, that started managing stress or sleep or whatever, did better. Okay? They lived better, they lived longer. And we, we all know and hear about body-mind connection, but I've come to the realization of the extreme significance of emotions in our long-term health. And although Western medicine saved me, and although I spent 15 years of my life developing this technology, I understand that all these are not enough, okay? And the, the typical Western medicine would either postpone the symptom or replace it with another one, but it typically will not cure diseases. And I think that the missing link is the emotional aspect. And uh, I would say my dream these days is that a new field of medicine would be established, something like emotional medicine. I, I don't know, I'm sure someone can come up with a better name, but. It's, it's all about technologies that can continuously monitor factors like stress levels, anxiety, depression. I know happiness is complex, but some, some technologies that would provide physicians with a quantifiable, scientific, objective measures that they can trust and consider just like they do with blood tests, blood pressure, etc. And I, I know it's not simple, okay, but I think that this is the future of medicine, not only to better cure, but to hopefully also prevent diseases. Just imagine again how much pain, how much sorrow would be saved from patients and their families if they could be warned, okay? How much healthcare costs would be saved by just preventing or, or better curing people, okay? And, and it's such a sad reality that today, healthcare budgets are focused or on illnesses, not on health, right? And a majority of the budgets are spent on the last two weeks of a patient's life. 
why not on their quality of life during all their life? I mean, is, is this right strategically? How did it happen? I'm not with Vision Sense anymore after 17 years. And uh, I would like now to promote this dream. I don't know how yet, but I'm patient with myself and I am asking you to assist in developing such technologies and basically making us healthier and happiness. This is the reason that I came here. Thank you very much and have an amazing day. Thank you, Avi. Um, powerful story. So you, by background, are an electrical engineer. You're not a medic. You're not a neuroscientist. What gave you the confidence to challenge the experts and say, no, I'm not going to have that urgent surgery? So first of all, um, I think that, um, unfortunately, most physicians are so conservative uh, that they would not think out of the box. I'm, I'm saying it with lots of sorrow because this machine of ours is the most sophisticated and complex organ on Earth. And it is so complex to try and figure and understand it out. And whatever I'm really proud saying is, I don't know. I love saying that because this is how I learn. But typically when you go to doctors, they feel uncomfortable saying, I don't know, right? So. Um, I'm happy that I'm not a physician, okay? Uh, not that I'm like the typical engineer, but um, sometimes to revolutionize the field, you have to come out of the field. And I'm, I'm saying that even if I would have had like a physics PhD, I would not, not have done it. So only my ignorance and the fact that I didn't understand uh, made this happen. Okay, and the fact that I fought and fought and fought, it just did not surrender. And obviously, you know the personal motivation that was involved here. Well, I have no simple answer, you know. I think you've inspired a few people to help push <laughs> the next stage of your journey. Thank you very much, Avi Aron. Thank you so much.